heard fantastic kind of layout here from your side of how you both, where you're coming from, so you got involved in this project, but I'd just like to hear it from your side. I mean, what, what have you guys, what, what's the roots of this project from your side, and why did you reach out to Jane, and, and how did you think about it when you started up? Um, sure. So, and, I, and uh, apologies in advance if I do a brief partisan digression for what is uh, otherwise a tech innovation event. Um, but so Move On has millions of members across the country. And uh, unsurprisingly, when we asked Move On members earlier this year what to focus on, they said the presidential race. And in particular, they said uh, defeating Donald Trump and what we see as sort of his particularly toxic brand of hatred, racism, sexism, misogyny. Um, and so we undertook an effort of figuring out what is the best way for millions of MoveOn members across the country to participate in this election. And part of the work we're doing sort of follows traditional electoral strategies. We have uh, volunteers in swing states knocking over a million doors. We have folks making phone calls. We're sharing videos on social media, things you'd expect an electoral effort to do. But part of the question that came up was there's millions of folks heavily invested in stopping Donald Trump who don't live in these special states, these 12 or so swing states where, let's face it, your vote has more value uh, than other folks because the election will likely be close. And the question we kept struggling with was, how can those folks be engaged, as Jane talked about? And now, the traditional response, as folks who've participated in election work know, is either make calls to sort of voters you don't know in those states, or you're asked to hop on a bus or get in a car, and if you live here, drive to Reno or somewhere in Nevada, um, and talk to voters there, who again, you don't know. And part of my hypothesis for why that's the case is uh, an idea of something my predecessor at MoveOn wrote about, which is the idea of a filter bubble, uh, which is now a commonly understood term that basically, in our social networks, we surround ourselves with people like us, and particularly online, social networking tools like Facebook reinforce that, right? You interact with content you're familiar with and that you like, and therefore you're shown more of that content, and eventually you only see content you agree with. Uh, and through what I think is confirmation bias, we start to believe that everyone we know thinks like us. And so imagine in the real world, you get a small group of progressives together, a small group of conservatives, they have a conversation that sounds like, how could anyone vote for Donald Trump? Or if the circumstances are reversed, how can somebody vote for Hillary Clinton? You laugh for 30 seconds, you can't imagine that possibility, and you move on to the next topic. Um, but what we found when talking to Move On members and other progressives was if you kept the conversation going for another minute, suddenly people would say, well, wait, my Uncle Hugh in Virginia might vote for Donald Trump. Or my friend in Ohio is so alienated by the political system that they might not vote at all. Or my cousin in Iowa is considering voting third party because they don't believe in the system or they don't like the nominee. And it dawned on us that for all these move on members across the country, there's actually swing voters in their social networks who live in these states where they can have tremendous influence. That all around move on members and other progressives and other voters across the country, there are swing voters in their social networks. And so we came to these two realizations. One, there's millions of people who don't yet currently know how to engage in the election, but care deeply about it. Um, and two, their swing voters in their social networks who they could reach if we only gave them a way to do that. Now, move on, most people know primarily because we flood your inbox with very long, earnest sounding emails. So we did the one thing we knew how to do, which is we, uh, my colleague, uh, sent a very long, earnest sounding email to Jane saying, hey, we have this problem, can you help? Um, and shockingly, for those of you who work in any kind of organizing or email marketing, despite having the email sent to one person, we had a 100% open rate and then 100% response rate. Um, and that Jane responded and said, I'm totally interested. And over the course of a set of uh, long Zoom conference calls, um, we really came to this notion that there's something here, that there is a possibility to use some of the tactics we, and strategies we talked about to give uh, millions of folks a chance to engage in this uh, election from home, uh, even if they don't live in swing states, because they have far more power than they realize if they work through their social network. Do you have any, can you, and now she laid out about it, I know there's stuff you can't talk about, but is there anything that was missing from what she talked about that you just would mention on, in, in uh, passing here in terms of uh, what's going to happen on Don't use October any real words. <laughs> well, I, I can't use you any real words. You have to use words. euphemisms for um, everything. I mean, I think the, the biggest 
you know, Jane brought the expertise and the strategic guidance on how to make games, how to make things have the right incentive structures, make people want to do these activities that frankly are oftentimes not that fun. I mean, imagine if I came up to you and said, hey, you know that Uncle Hugh who you think probably disagrees with you, it might be over for Thanksgiving? Can you call him and talk to him about the election? <laughs> right? That doesn't sound that appealing off the bat. And part of the, the reason we got excited about this approach was um, very often in political organizing, as in much of life, you know, like 15% of the people do 85% of the work. That's not an approach that would work here because the reality is we're not trying to barrage hundreds and hundreds of people we don't know with political communication. What we want to do is find a vehicle for mass engagement for lots and lots of people to reach out to one, two, three people in their social network. And so, the, so part of what we're trying to do here that's different and that's distinct from past attempts that have tried similar strategies is we're not trying to give you a tool to like text 10,000 people you don't know at scale. Part of the approach here is to really enable lots and lots of people to talk to just a couple of people in their social network and to leverage the most powerful tool in elections, which, and this is gonna shock you, is a one-to-one -one authentic conversation with a voter, particularly a voter you know. And so um, there's going to be a lot of great incentives, there's gonna be a lot of elements Jane talked about, but fundamentally the, at the core of this will be real people talking to people they know listening to them and having a one-to-one -one interaction about the election to get them to participate and get them to participate in the way we hope they do. And if I could add to that, um, there have been a lot of efforts to gamify political engagement around campaigns in the past that look like typical gamification where the incentives are things like points and you know leveling up to new titles and achievement badges and leaderboards. We're not doing any of that. So I don't want you to think that this is going to be, um, this is a game. This is not gamification. And what, what we're trying to do is actually give people superpowers. You know, when I design a game, I try to imagine what skill or power can I give people that will make them feel stronger, more capable, more awesome than they have ever felt in that context before. And, and that's where the gamefulness comes in. It's that you feel like Super Mario who just ate the mushroom. You feel like Pac-Man that just ate the power pellet. Um, you are gonna literally be empowered by this game um, in ways. We're gonna make it possible for you to do things that was not possible before. And that's what makes this gameful. It's not, it's not a bunch of points. So, you know, I just, when you say incentives, the incentive is you're gonna be awesome. That is the incentive. And, uh, that's, that's why I, that it makes it different from previous projects in the space, I think. We promise you no points. Yeah, there are no points. No points. <laughs> and just a lot, and then we're, we're gonna then turn to questions for yourself, whether it's in the earlier part of your talk or this part, whatever. Um, but I wanna ask one more. I mean, you've been through a lot of drills at Move On in different elections. What makes you think that this is, do you think this is different? Do you think this has the potential to actually have an impact that uh, other traditional, more traditional got the vote um, wouldn't have had? And why would you think that? Sure, well, so we've had a lot of experience doing the kind of traditional electoral work we've talked about. So I know a couple of folks actually have come up to me and said this. In 2004, we ran one of the largest door-to-door -door canvases in the country, and we found an 8% increase in people who turned out when they had a one-to-one -one conversation. Now, 8% doesn't seem like a lot, but when the 2000 elections decided by 537 votes, or the 2004 election by 60,000 votes in Ohio, or in numerous Senate races by 312 votes here, or 1,000 votes there, it makes a huge difference. Now, what we know this time is, no one's tried what we're setting out to do here. This is gonna be new, but there's some data points that tell us, hey, there might just be something here. So, um, if you look at the Pew research that Jane talked about earlier, 62% of Americans say that their primary source of information is social media, of news, 62%. It's even higher amongst millennial voters who, by the way, have the highest cohort of undecided or unlikely to vote in this election. Um, on top of that, uh, when Facebook two years ago tried a little experiment, they basically tried to increase voter turnout by doing one of two things, they either broadcast that it's election day, go vote, or they had people mark, uh, sort of check off, I voted today, and shared it on their friend's feed. And what they found is that if you saw something shared from a friend that said, I voted, versus if you saw a broadcast message from Facebook, you were about six times more likely to then self-report that you too voted. 
part of that is makes sense, right? Because if your friends are sharing with you, then when you report that I voted, it'll share it with them, and there's positive social reinforcement for that. Um, there was also a very small study done in Texas recently, where in a small race, in a small place, they actually took it a step further, and they said, will you tag your friend when you vote? So not just appearing in your stream, well, it actually said, John, I voted today, and then suddenly popped up, and they saw huge returns, like 15% plus. Now, we don't expect those numbers in a presidential race, right? A, a presidential race where many people are tuned in looks different than a small race somewhere in Texas. But when more people are playing video games in this country than participating in elections, there's a whole bunch of people who can be engaged. And so the working theory here is go where people are, have authentic communication between people in their social graph, um, and use tools that have been proven to work and add elements that really make people feel much more powerful. Will this move tens of millions of votes? Probably not. But if we start with 10,000 people, which is our goal early on, 10,000 people talking and just one or two people on a network, and then unlocking it and making it go to more and more people, and having some elements of learning where people find out what makes them more powerful, share it with the community, and other people can use it, we think that can make a difference in a whole bunch of places. And particularly if this race is close, whether on the presidential level or a couple of Senate races, I think there's good evidence to believe that these kinds of one-to-one -one conversation will both feel empowering and also could help uh, flip an election here or there. Well, I think that's a good time to talk. Swing it to the collective brain power in the audience here. Um, and again, we've heard a lot of interesting stuff here. Uh, we have two mics. You're all going to be, you'll be videoed on camera here. And uh, we'd like to hear questions from anybody on Jane's presentation or, for that matter, this new project. And Jane, why don't you, do you want to get in the middle here? Yeah, yeah and right also, uh, although it takes me away from my coffee, also <laughs> comments, ideas, provocations, not just questions, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Feedback. This is original stuff. People have never heard it. Let's start with this woman here. And can some, we get the runners? Oh, okay. Uh, Pikachu can pet me. Around the front here. There you go. Um, hey, Jay, I'm a big fan. I bought all of your books, multiple copies, different digital and uh, paper copies. So, <laughs> <laughs> however, um, gamification is a concept. I mean, by the way, I'm my name is Sean. I'm in game industry, so I work on uh, user acquisition and game marketing. One of the things that we have learned in the past couple of years is that pure gamification it's actually very hard. I remember one of the company that used to be high profile called Badgeville, and I can't hear them anymore. I, I don't know if, I hope I'm not offending anybody working for them now. Mm -hmm. So what you said, that this is a game, this is not a gamification with points, badges, and leaderboards. I'm fascinated about what actually that means. I know you can't release details, but can you paint a broader stroke picture of what's the difference between game and gamification? And, and what, maybe just a little bit details what you can release about that. <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, so when somebody asks me to make something more like a game, um, I think about how can I make it unreasonably difficult, which is not actually what we're doing technically. Um, but oftentimes you think about how do I create a challenge for somebody that is more interesting, provokes more curiosity, more creativity, where they genuinely don't know if they can do it or not. And um, so I'm gonna say like, the example of how I would gamify something. If, if uh, at the end of the session, we're all gonna leave the room. If someone asked me to gamify that, um, well, typical gamification would say, um, you will get one point for every person who leaves the room uh, by eight o'clock. Oh, yay, and we'll level up or something, I don't know. Um, what I would do is I would try to make it unreasonably hard. So, uh, okay, we have to leave the room, but nobody's feet can touch the floor. <laughs> now, I would hope that would be a more interesting experience to you than just getting a point for every person who left the room because you're thinking, how are we gonna do that? We're gonna have to work together. We're gonna have to try things. I've never tried to get you know 200 people out of a room <laughs> with no feet on the floor. Um, and you start to spark creativity and experimentation. Um, how that relates to what we're doing, although we are trying to make it, we are making it magically easy in the sense of uh, showing to you all the undecided and swing state voters in your network. So this is suddenly way easier than it did ever been before. We are providing you a challenge that I think most people would not have seriously considered as within 
the scope of their capabilities. Uh, so we're asking people to, uh, to swing voters, to swing voters that they think might not be able to be swung. And we've been play testing this for a while. And uh, I've had some of the most amazing conversations with my parents who are uh, vote typically in a way that I am not excited about. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> has been really upsetting, to be honest, over the, the past you know, decade. Um, and this game has allowed me to finally, by giving me weird ways to do it, ways that I've never tried before, by proposing things as different as trying to get out of the room without letting your feet touch. So we're not only are we showing people that you can influence, but we're giving you like 100 different ways to talk to them or try to influence them that may be things you've never tried before, that may unlock your creativity, unlock some kind of curiosity in the person you're talking to. Um, and that's, that's the most that I can say. But we're bringing, we're gonna do stuff that you haven't done before and in, and in doing so, um, it will be a different experience, a different set of emotions, and we hope a different outcome. Do you, do you have anything to add to that? Okay, is it over here? Uh, it's, it's just say your name and if any affiliation if you wanna mention it. Yep. So stand up, please. Um, Mike Matessa, no real affiliation, just uh, love your work. I love these three points from Pokemon that can be applied to this. Um, and then the last part you said I think was really important, that how you engage these people um, in the swing states. So I have friends that are conservatives that are really different from me. Um, and how do I get them to change their mind? Uh, I've been trying to think of it from things like uh, moral foundation theory. They have really different values than I do. Um, they have values of authority and in-group that people like Trump appeal to that I don't know how to change. So I was wondering if you would have any way to address that. Uh, do you want that way now, or do you just want to know if it's in the game? It's in the game, yeah. So, well, I mean, we've been doing a lot of research so that we can show you things that seem to be effective, um, and, and testing and socializing, um, and the, Part of the way the game works is that as different people try different things and report back on how that's going, we'll be able to develop a collective intelligence around you basically saying, this is the situation I'm in, this is the type of voter that I am want to have a conversation with and what their values are, and we'll be able to give you the exact power up that you need that we think is going to be most effective in that context. And the more people who play, the more we'll be able to do that in a way that I think is incredibly respectful of people's values and starts from a foundation that people who are voting a different way from you have genuine uh, beliefs that are important and matter. And uh, I, I have to say, I feel like it's a very respectful game in that way, too. I found it very healing. Some of the people I've talked to in playtesting this, I felt our relationships were healed by being able to talk about these differences in a way that was less antagonistic and, um, and, and more empathetic, maybe, so. Which is different than the traditional route, which is you call someone and you read off a script. And, and it, there's both no foundation of trust between you and the person, and the conversation goes in a, in a very different way than one that could potentially move that person. People, put, if people want to say, put, put your hands up, because we don't have a ton of time for questions, but if you have a question, uh, put your hands up. I see some back here, but we have someone right here that's ready to go. Hi, my name is Isiad. I work at a company called Hustle, uh, we're a text messaging app. But uh, I was kind of wondering uh, how, how the touches that are going to be made through this game are going to factor into the efforts of, of wider move on, right? So how it impacts like what sort of emails people are getting, what sort of text messages they're getting, what sort of phone calls they're getting, and the cadence. Um, sure. So one of the interesting things, if you go to topsecretelectiongame.com, uh, you will not be signed up for a stream of 100 daily emails from Move On from here at the election. <laughs> In fact, all we'll do is we will send you a first update when the game is ready to play. Um, uh, and part of that is because we want people to sign up. We want you to be ready for October 10th when it launches uh, and to give the game a shot. Um, so partially this is an experiment, right? Our, the part of the premise here is that we are not trying to sign you up to then get move on email updates about how to vote in the election. Uh, the theory here is to create a way for individuals to communicate with other individuals in their social network and then um, 
at the end, the outcome we hope for is they participate and vote. So uh, in some sense, this will be run fairly distinctly from a lot of the other electoral work that MoveOn is doing. We use Hustle, they're fantastic. Um, they, uh, it, it's a, it allows us to text people at scale, uh, which is fascinating because you can have one-to-many conversations. This is a little bit different, and it's different because you're having one-to-one -one conversations with somebody you know and have a relationship with. So this will be parallel to the sort of more traditional electoral work we do. And part of that is because we think the power here is, this is not a broadcast medium. This is not a medium where there is, um, whether it's a move on volunteer or a move on staff member who's reaching out to lots of people with something that's fairly generic. What we want to do is provide a way for ordinary people to talk to people in their social network and to do it in a way that makes them more powerful and hopefully more impactful. Can I just ask uh, Jane to broaden this as well too, is um, I know it's the first one out of the shoot here that you're working on in the post Pokemon world, but would you say this is applicable in all kinds of different areas in terms of beyond politics? these kind of things into business and d different kind of ways to kind of apply these same techniques? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of people uh, in healthcare and education take Pokemon Go very seriously. Um, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who are already thinking about ways to try to emulate that sense of abundant on-demand opportunities for success um, and that everyone around you is a potential ally. Um, so I would think education and healthcare are the first two spaces that we'll see that. And also a lot of um, internal HR divisions that I've been talking to for big big companies are thinking maybe we can have people show up at work with this sense that, that there are abundant opportunities to be successful today. But even this game, this is one of the first post-Pokemon Go games that you, coming off your research here. Are there other game ideas you can see kind of flowing out of this? For me personally. Yeah, in another kind of field. Basically. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, I, I work full time at the Institute for the Future, and we do a lot of work to get people feeling that there are futures for them that could be positive and empowering, even when we're facing things that create a lot of anxiety. For example, automation, robots taking our jobs, this is a future that creates a lot of anxiety for people. Um, can we help people imagine what's the, what are the better versions of this future? You know, what does a America post work look like? What is, what is a new American dream if our lives aren't organized around full-time jobs or our educations aren't organized around full-time jobs? Um, what does that look like? And so we're constantly creating immersive and gameful experiences and we have one platform in particular called the Foresight Engine, which is massively multiplayer forecasting and I am definitely looking to bring what some of what we've created here for top secret election game, not their real name, um, to bring that to our foresight engine so that we can continue to help people. I, people don't need to feel that the future will definitely be fine and rosy and we don't have to do anything, but we want them to be able to imagine some version of the future that is not so anxiety producing that they can stay engaged with it and not just feel angry and disempowered. Now, there's one over here. We just have a few last questions yeah. before we're gonna, all going to break up and connect, talk okay. and have a few Hi, drinks. Hi, Jane. I became very, oh, sorry. My name is Rika. Um, I was formerly at NVIDIA uh, working with a lot of the developers, and I became very familiar with your work back then and a number of your fan base. Um, also, I grew up in Japan, so, of course, I love Pokemon, right? So I have to throw that out there. So my question is, the analogy that I see here with what you're doing with the election that's similar to what you started your talk with, with um, health care and, and disease cure, it's almost similar in that we're coming in after the fact, mm. right? There are candidates that are there, it's after the fact. How do we go in there and create a cure one way or the other? Mm. So I'm curious to know if you see an opportunity where the extension of this after the fact is where you're empowering people that might not otherwise feel like they are a candidate material mm. to actually proactively and sort of preventatively get in the game so that we're not faced with ki this kind of similar situation. Now, there's a lot about the whole two-party system or two-party plus system that is to be addressed, but <coughs> not just doing like a flash mob moment with election, but how do we create a continued dialogue and engagement such that the landscape of when we get to the next election cycle, that that looks different. And the kind of people that are engaged at that level are super empowered to be part of the candidate yeah. profile, as yeah. it were. What a wonderful idea. I will be completely honest and say, I had not thought of that wonderful idea myself, <laughs> and I, I love it. And you're making me think, again, 
what if every day, not just until election day, I could wake up and open up my game and see abundant opportunities for me to have a positive impact. Um, that sort of daily continuous engagement with political issues, I think, could lay the foundation for a next generation of people to feel like they are informed enough, they are regularly engaged enough, they're connected to a community enough that they would envision themselves as being potential candidates. What do you think about this idea? Yeah. It's cool, right? I love it. I mean, the, the question of how do you uh, in, incentivize or empower people to do ongoing civic engagement, uh, absolutely critical. And part of what we do now is we see these surges of interest and energy and excitement around election time, and then it fades away. And I think, how do you solve that in an ongoing way? How do you make people want to engage uh, in this process the day after the election and the two or four years in between? I think it's absolutely essential to try to explore. So I love that instinct. What an interesting idea, actually, hearing you say that. There should be like a giant campaign the day after where it's like, great, now that most of you are not gonna do anything for four more years, here are like 10 things you can do today that are amazingly important. Um, and, you know, yeah. get that going, yeah. Next year, that'll be our game next year. Top secret post-election game. Yes! <laughs> Let's get working at it. Um, any last hands, we got a guy here, but any last hands, we're gonna have one last question after this? Okay, we got someone up here, okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think she um, answered part of the question or she, she presented the question I was gonna ask in a sense. My name is Gerald. Um, formerly, I was a deputy political director for the California Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And I had one question for each of you. Uh, the first was, um, you know, the election is going to be over in, in seven, seven weeks. So what are you doing to focus on policy moving forward? Um, I'm, I'm thinking that will be the answer of what do you do after the election? Um, second, uh, right now, currently, I'm uh, designing a high school in Oakland, and it's new and innovative. We're focusing on the digital economy. So how do you bring education and uh, game design together to motivate uh, students? Um, I, we recently had a, a round table in Oakland with students, and they were all inspired by Pokemon. So how do you bring that, that energy, that that uh, gaming into the education process? I can answer that question very quickly. Just there are two charter schools that have leaps and bounds above other experiments, done amazing work, and put a, a lot of it online in terms of curriculum and what's a day at the school look like, and you can go and visit. Um, one is the Playmaker School in Los Angeles. It's a Playmaker that you can, they'll be, be happy for you to come down and hang out. Um, and then Quest to Learn in New York City. Um, are the two schools that have done the most in terms of not bringing games into the classroom, which a lot of people do, but they try to design the entire experience of your education to feel more like a game. It's not about putting games into and learning everything through a game. Um, and they have so much information on both of their websites and examples that I would encourage you to look at those two. Um, and then, yeah, what are we going to do? with this platform, because we've said after this election, I mean, you would not believe the amount of work and energy getting put into building this thing that is playable and relevant for four weeks. And launching If we October launch time. on time, yeah. <laughs> Three weeks if we launch not on time. Um, we want to do stuff with it afterwards. What kind of things can you imagine us using this for, maybe with regards to policy or continued engagement? I mean, I think the, the key challenge to solve is this question of agency. Right? It's people feeling like they don't have agency in the political process. And in some sense, trying to solve it in an election should be the simplest, right? because you have a vote. But I think the Brexit example was interesting, because if you looked at news stories the next day, there were all these people saying, oh, I don't think my vote would count. Um, so in the electoral context, there's sort of a, a, a quantifiable way to solve that. Right? It's get people to vote, show them that their vote matters, give people some agency over moving other votes, which is what this game is trying to achieve. I think after the election, the question will be thinking about what are the opportunities and what's the agency. Um, when we started this process, I think we first came to Jane with some ideas that were incredibly depressing. They were like, imagine what a world looks like under Trump. And for a whole set of people, that was like the last thing you wanted to do if you wanted to get people to do things in the world, right? Because it's, it's a downer. And I think part of the challenge after the election, because I hate to break it to folks, the likeliest outcome is 
paralysis in Washington and very unclear opportunities for policy change will be to think about what is it that people can do in their day-to-day -day lives that can make an impact in their communities, and then how do we use the same platform to bring in other people into that same joint pro project. So I think that'll take a lot of work to think through post-election, but the challenge remains because uh, the solutions to seeing impact are not going to come from Washington, D.C. or from elsewhere. They're going to have to come from what individuals can do day-to-day, -day, and then how they can engage with other people who are like-minded or not uh, to make those joint projects and to achieve things together. And I think that's a totally important and essential problem to try to solve. Well, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of more questions here, but there's not a lot of time, and I think this is a great, what we like in this is to actually have time after the discussion here for people to talk, grab it, something to eat. There's more food coming out, different food, more drinks, a little time here to chat. Jane's here, Ilya's here, we could talk. But I would say, why don't we give it up a one last really big hand for Jane. Awesome presentation.